Moments ago, we saw the end of Mexico and Argentina in Group C action. Argentina hanging another dos a cero on L3. The game-winning goal. Surprise, surprise from Lionel Messi. Why don't you tell everybody what it was like to watch me suffer since you're just so happy about it. I'm not happy. I'm not happy that Mexico lost, obviously. Uh, only one goal for CONCACAF teams in six games. So mm. That's not a good stat. Uh, I thought Mexico would uh, be one of those leaders in that category. It was something. <laughs> based, based on we will what? Get, we will get to it. We will okay. get to okay. it. Okay. Um, yep. It was something else. It always is something else watching a game with you. I don't think the rest of our colleagues knew what they were in store for. There was a couple pens being thrown. I'm just glad nobody was hurt. Yes. Uh, yeah. No, it was, it was uh, a very tense atmosphere. Just to kind of take you behind the curtain here at the ESPN setup. We have our studio here. Literally, I mean, a cardboard, some type of makeshift wall separates us from ESPN Argentina on the other side. There's a very uh, different mood on that set. Right below them is ESPN Mexico. They're broadcasting right now Football Picante. All of us are kind of in this area watching the game together. There's also TVs that are on different delays, so we would hear goals and shouts and screams. You heard <sighs> you heard one or two shell of uh, your mother's that was uh, an <laughs> indication that something had happened. The second half. Let's start from the Mexico side. What do you make of El Tri's performance in this game? The performance? Yeah. It's a little bit more nuanced, right? We can discuss the result. The result's a disaster. Uh, the result. You, know, you don't want to lose, and you don't want to lose by two. It's a bad result we, yes. because goal differential comes into play. You goal difference is the only way through for Mexico Correct. now. You don't want to lose by multiple goals, which ended up being that scenario. The performance in general, if there was one thing we'd been telling our colleagues here um, when they asked, how would Mexico play right. against Argentina? And a lot of my colleagues, you included, were saying and they were adamant that Mexico would not betray its DNA. They would not sit back. They would not give Argentina the ball. They have to have the ball to feel mm -hmm. good. Even if they lose, mueren de pie. That was kind of the, the notion around here. That wasn't the case. They conceded the ball. They went to a line of three center backs, five, so it's three, five, two, and you tried to absorb. And, and for, honestly, the first 45 minutes, mm -hmm. decent. You're like, okay, they're really disrupting Argentina's rhythm here. Might I say really good? I mean, did Memo have to make a big stop? Was no, there a particularly no, no. dangerous moment in that first a half? And you, No, there wasn't. And you would have honestly have bet that the best chance came from Mexico. There was a set piece, mm -hmm. Luis Chavez, uh, that I believe Montes almost got on the end on, that ended up bouncing across the face of the goal. And you're like, okay, I could see this going one of two ways. Argentina getting desperate, Argentina getting frustrated. They need a result. Uh, maybe pressing forward and... and picking them apart on the counter. Even though that's not the Mexico way, no. Chucky and Ale especially Alexis Vega, anytime there was open space, you just felt Alexis Vega had that opportunity or had that ability to break out. That wasn't the case. Second half comes about, you concede possession to them again. But now this time, possession isn't in the midfield or around their uh, own defensive third. It's in your defensive mm. third. It's in their offensive end. It's really in front of you. And that's when they started coming apart. That's when the nerves, that's when the not being able to play a certain way because you've never played that way. Yeah. The being unfamiliar with the setup came into play. And and, and we'll get into it, but the not having Edson Alvarez on the yeah. field for me, uh, it showed how crucial it was in both goals. So I'm thinking about it from the first half because obviously the second half is where the goals fall. The game kind of totally changes uh, at that point. But at halftime, I won't sit here and say, I felt good about Mexico's performance because the bottom line question with this team in this game, uh, as it was against Poland, is who in the heck is going to score? Beyond score, it's not a team that's missing chances. It's a team that's not creating chances. Now, maybe they weren't set up to create a lot of chances in this game, but there's you watch this Mexico team and there's very little hope outside of a set piece, which to think of that as Mexico's best chance tells you all you need to know about this L3, that they're going to score. So then you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, as we've said before, there's a saying, would firma, firmas un empate, would you sign for a tie right now? And at halftime, you're looking at it 0-0, and I'm feeling very good about Mexico's defensive performance, not just in that they had limited Argentina in the final third from really getting that great chance to make Memo have to make that great save or, or even a desperate defensive challenge. They were making Argentina look bad, or maybe Argentina was making themselves look bad. There was a lot of pressure on the ball, and that pressure from Mexico was resulting in turnovers. My, my big problem, and again, it's, it's to the point that I started with, even when there was a turnover, 
And even when that turnover was in a dangerous spot in the field, the strategy, the setup was such that it was Alexis Vegas trips it off a guy, immediately he's one on three, and maybe Chucky's 30 yards away, and it's really like two on five. Chucky. That is hopeless. Chucky. That is hopeless. And that's all. Every time Mexico had a, a split second of danger, as soon as they took the wide shot, you immediately knew nothing's going to yeah. happen here. There's nobody in the attack. Yeah. And just let me finish that off because, you know, it's only the two guys up front. Mexico plays in the 5 3 2. We'll discuss that, that choice, that formation in a second. But the three guys in midfield to start this game Andres Guardado. Hector Herrera and Luis Chavez. Who, who of those guys is honestly going to be the late arriver or the guy to help that attack? It ain't going to be Achiacha making a 40 yard nope. run. It ain't going to be Guardado making nope. a 40 yard run. So you're cutting out one guy out of those three Luis to join Chavez. an attack that's still only two guys. So even if Chavez comes, man, even if he gets there, it's three on five, it's three on six. And you can say whatever you want about the Argentine defense and how it stacks up against other Argentina defenses of the past. But those five, six guys against Chucky, against Alexis, and against a late arriving, maybe Luis Chavez, that's a horrible mismatch. And that is never, ever, ever going to end up in a goal for Mexico. And not even going to end up in a threat. And that's what we saw in the first half. Uh, you saw that throughout the game, actually. You, you saw it because, because I don't Chiquito think there was Sano. as many turnovers from Argentina in the second half oh, as there was no, the first. No, no, I think no, they no turnovers. I'm yeah. talking about the Mexico attackers uh, yeah. being surrounded by the Argentine defenders. Mm -hmm. I think Chucky Lozano had one in the second half where you literally looked over. He tried getting the corner out of it. Yes. He looked over and he was with, he was by himself yes. against five players. Yes. Uh, like he didn't even have an option to hopefully cross it into the box too. So there's a saying, there's a saying. Mm -hmm. Plantamiento cobarde. Yes, a uh, cowardly formation or setup. Yes, it's a cowardly setup. Mm -hmm. That's what Tata Martino did today. He played not to lose and it blew up in his face. Now, okay, okay, is playing not to lose cowardly? Or me. smart, because let, and let me t let me tell you well, where you, the nuance is. You, you should answer that question well, for me, because uh, you were telling, and all my Mexican colleagues were telling anybody who would listen uh -huh. that that goes against Mexico's DNA. Okay, right. Let's talk about Mexico's DNA. Okay. Jugar como nunca, perder como siempre. No, nope. play like you never have before in terms of play really, really well, but lose like you always do before. And what that really means is that when you play big teams. You, you rise to the occasion, but you lose. You lose heroically because you go al tu por tu. No, you go, right. you go toe to toe. You don't do what a lot of underdogs do, which is sit back and counter, which is what Mexico did today. What I would say is Tata Martino knows very well just how bad, perhaps more than anybody else, this version of Mexico is compared to the Mexicos of 2018, of 2014, of 2010. He specifically knows it in the attack. This team is not dangerous. This team is not as good as the Mexicos of the past. This team was incapable of playing al tu por tu with Argentina. So he had, I think, no choice but to set up as he did. And what I think we saw was a perfectly executed game plan until a moment of magic from the greatest of all time, right? Messi, if the, if, the, if the goal that beats you against Argentina is a messy shot from outside the box that beats your great shot-stopping goalie. Was this more messy or was this just not having the right personnel? And, and but, that, but that personnel wanna, limited Messi and limited wanna, Argentina for the first 65 minutes. Saudi, Didn't Arabia, they? Saudi Arabia limited Messi and limited Argentina, and they beat Argentina. So where do you want to go with this? Because if you're going to sit here and try to make me believe that this Mexican team, that this year, this calendar year, lost a CONCACAF Nations League final to the United States off of set pieces, and then in the Gold Cup played against a C team from the United States and lost to them in that final, and then in World Cup qualifying, lost in Cincinnati against the U.S. 2-0, and then couldn't beat the U.S. in the Azteca, couldn't beat Canada in the Azteca, couldn't beat Costa Rica in the Azteca. If you're trying to tell me that was an indication that all of a sudden something was going to change at this World Cup, I don't buy it. And let me tell you this. So you're agreeing with me. This uh, team had no capacity to play out Porto with anybody of quality. No, no, and, and, and a struggling Argentina. I, I think that's an Argentina at half gas. Now, you don't have to ask me, but regardless of the result versus Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. I'm convinced Tata Martino shouldn't have been here at this World Cup. They should have made a move when they had a chance. When? What has he showed you? What has he showed you yes. throughout the last 18 months what no. you think this I, team is capable of something in this World Cup? The last time that this team looked good was before the pandemic in 2019. 
that's the last time that this team really looked good. Yeah, there were a lot of things that were really different in the world. But yes. Raul Jimenez was healthy for one. Exactly. And I think when we talk about this attack and the decisions that were made and, and the lack of punch that it has, a lot of it comes down to Tata Martino's stubbornness to rely on Raul Jimenez, not necessarily to bring and him to And not just this, him. Well, not to, just to bring him to this tournament, but throughout qualifying to not try to find another answer. Well, not just him. Because in World Cup qualifying, Tecatito Corona was one of the most criticized players throughout all of World Cup qualifying for Mexico. Mm -hmm. And he stuck with them. Hector Herrera, Guardado. I, I see him. I'm sorry. I'm, I just see a big difference between Raul and Tecatito. No, 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 no. But what I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to go with you. La terquidad de, de, de Tata Martino. Yes. The stubbornness of Tata Martino. Because people could sit here and they say, well, the best players are at this World Cup. But in that time, you could have progressed an Alexis Vega, much more. Mm. He could have had much more opportunity. A Henry Martin, much more opportunity. There were players who were playing well in their domestic clubs in Liga MX who never got a sniff with Tata Martino. And he would rely on the same players. Jesus Gallardo. Yeah. Jesus Gallardo who was benched by Aguirre in Monterrey. Was still getting called was in. Was still getting yes. called in. At one point, Chaka Rodriguez was still getting called in until it, Pio Correra made it. Well, you're saying one point. We're not talking about that long ago. It's during World Cup qualifiers. So what I'm trying to tell you is Tata Martino's as much to blame yes. for things going on right now than, hey, it's just a talent pool type of thing. It's a talent pool situation. Yes, and I think that the great kind of comparison is the U.S. men's national team. Dis because you can throw the pandemic in as an excuse to be like, well, I lost this year, I lost this year to experiment, so I come out of this year and i got to stick with what I know works, right? To get through qualifying, it's triage at that point. You're just trying to get through, and you don't have time to right. kind of evolve the right. team, right? You don't have that, well, that opportunity. Greg Berhalter evolved the team. He sad. forced those young guys sad. in, and Tata Martino never, ever, he ever did had, that with He this. even had, it, had to do it behind the eight ball of 13 months where he wasn't there. It was Dave Sarikin. There you go. He had to fast track these kids. There you and go. And I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's something that he went through that Tata Martino – could have had time to yes. do on his own and evolve this team. All right, let's get into kind of the big moments of the game. Obviously, the, the game-winning goal is the big moment. It comes from Lionel Messi. But what did what did you and I do as soon as that goal? Actually, I think after I threw my pen. I wrote and, it down. I, I put, typed it in my phone. You, you, you looked at me, and you started to say it was right in the zone, and I pointed to my notepad. What does it say? That's where Edson should have been, right? It comes, it comes across the top of the area. Hector Herrera is in the picture, but kind of loses track of Messi for a second. Doesn't get anywhere near him. The ball comes across, and right in that zone, that space right in front of the Mexican back line, Messi has time to touch, control, set up on that godly left foot, and bury it past Memo Choa. And it wasn't even a worldly of a shot. Uh, honestly, if somebody hmm. steps up on time, I don't think he has that Are you shot. putting it on Memo? No, I don't think it's on Memo. You can't, you, can can't I, have, you can't have a player who's, who's that right. good in front of you 20 yards out and, and to pick a corner. Uh, but if somebody is pushing up there, he doesn't have that shot. He doesn't have that very, that option of driving it. He's got to disguise it somehow. He's got to change the hips. He's got to go in step. He's got to go high. He can't drive it the way he drove it. That's the specialty of being in that spot and breaking that type of opportunity of Edson Alvarez. Your only informed player. Mm-hmm. Not just right now, of the last like 18 months, two years. He's the only informed player you've had at a high level, the only Class A player. Chelsea wanted him for 50 million. Who else does the Mexican national team have? Is there even a defense for Tata Martino if he says, well, look, for, until Messi does that thing, my game plan worked, right? Is there a defense there for him at all? What's the game plan, to go 0-0? Yes, that was clearly the game plan, I think, right? He, I mean, when you start with five at the back, he did, it, and you've it, never really done worked, that before. It worked for 45 minutes. And, and, and the one player we all had questions about his fitness, mm -hmm. his ability to physically play with that midfield, mm -hmm. his body gave up on him. Andres Guardado Andres coming Guardado. off uh, in the 41st minute. And then Guti comes on, who you've been yelling at the high heavens yep. to get an opportunity, yep. and he's at fault for the second goal. And look, I'm not going to fault him. Really, because it's very difficult to come it's into a, a game. Lasso, yeah. Yes, and, and, and that one is a worldly. But he was stone feet. He was put in a bad position right there. It's not his specialty. And yeah. then Fernandez, Enzo Fernandez picked his corner, and it, and it was a beautiful goal. So I think if I thought that the ways in which Mexico would concede in this World Cup, I thought set pieces, you know, even if it's from the run of play, crosses coming in, Memo not coming out, I really wouldn't have thought that Memo would get beaten on – Two shots. Now, I know the Enzo one, we see it from an angle. It's a curler. It looks beautiful. The messy one is from outside the area. Um, it's, it's not in the angle. 
you you kind of suggested almost that like it wasn't that great of a shot. If we if we put in perspective that Memo's like all time thing he does best is shot stopping. Is any of that on him? Either of those two? The goal goes in be between somebody's leg, like literally under the leg. It's very difficult for Memo to react. I, it's, I, you it's know what hard, it is? It's hard and it's slow. And this this is where I give Messi yeah. cre credit. Messi's one of the few players in the world that's so smart at disguising his shots, uh, 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 picking his corner, picking exactly where he wants to do, manipulating the football. He knew exactly what he wanted to do and where he wanted to put it because he saw that opening. What I'm trying to tell you is with a player like Edson Alvarez, that opening maybe isn't there. Mm. So I hold Memo to a high World Cup standard because we've seen it before. And I think we've seen him make similar saves to that. We've seen it against Brazil. We've seen it against Germany. But if you're going to rely on Memo Cho to after he's already made the big save that, he, that you're, you can honestly count penalty. on from a goalie in a tournament save on you know one of the greatest strikers of all time from the penalty spot, uh, then you really are effectively, it's a hope and a prayer, right? That, that, and that's not really, I think, fair to, to put on Memo. Uh, let's talk about Messi and how they dealt with him. Because until that goal, he's quiet. Yeah. Or is that fair? Do you think he was he was louder than quiet? He had his moments, and that's the thing with Messi. Those moments are, are All something right, else. All right, but, but, but they didn't lead to anything. It, it, he attracts so many players, it doesn't look like it leads to something, but it does lead to something. But where? Where were those great chances? Well, he had the one where he spun around Guardado and then ended up making Luis Chavez. That creates a lot, and then it's a chance for Argentina into the final third. But when you're that type of player, it's not like – Hey, he beats one player. He attracts four players right. at a time. So is it then on the other guys that didn't take advantage? A little bit. Because yeah. this is very, honestly, if you look at this Argentina team, this isn't the same Argentina team that we've been sold on. 35 straight wins, I believe. 36, yeah. 36 straight. 36 unmatched, uh, unbeaten, not 30, straight wins. Yeah. I'm sorry, 36 unbeaten. Uh, you look at some of Until these Saudi. players. You, you, well, you look at some of these players, and you look at like a, a France, you look at a Brazil, and you look where their players play. Yeah. You know, how many of these players are prime players, huge players in the best teams in the world? Right. And, and especially in the back, you know? Benfica, Atleti, you know? You, it starts, you start, and, and they would tell you, our Argentine colleagues would tell you, especially at the outside back positions, they get thin. So I think you can hurt this team. I think other teams have found out Maybe they're not as strong as we once thought. I certainly don't see this team right now as one of the favorites. I don't know if you do. No. I well, thank you very much for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming, premium content, and let's not forget as well, ESPN FC, seven days a week. Subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.